But the big story this hour, China's National People's Congress has abolished the presidential term limit. China has approved the removal of term limits for its leader in a move that effectively can allow Xi Jinping to remain president for life. The constitutional changes were passed by China, China's annual sitting of the National People's Congress. The vote was widely regarded as a rubber stamping exercise. Two delegates voted against the change and three abstained out of 2,964 votes. China has imposed a two-term limit on its president since the 1990s. The Chinese President Xi Jinping, however, defied tradition of presenting a potential successor during October's Communist Party Congress. In late February, the party proposed removing term limits from China's constitution. She was due to step down in 2023. On paper, the Congress is the most powerful legislative body in China, similar to the parliament in other nations, but it's widely believed that it would approve that it was uh, what it was told to by the ruling party. So that's the big story coming out of China. It is uh, what was expected to take place. 2,964 delegates voting, only two saying no, three abstaining, the rest giving the go-ahead for the abolishment of presidential term limits. Uh, does that mean the man on your screens there, Xi Jinping, is going to be president for life? And on the broadcast with me right now is Aina Tangen. He's a political and economic uh, commentator joining us from Beijing. Uh, is it fair to say, uh, Aina, that uh, this abolishing of the presidential term limit is as good as uh, assuming that it's going to be President Xi as China's president for life? No, I, I think uh, that's not the right assumption. I think that's jumping to a conclusion. Uh, you'll note that uh, there are no new powers conferred to the president. Uh, you have to remember that the main uh, areas of power in the Chinese system are as the head of the party, uh, chairman, and then also head of the military commission. Those do not have formal, uh, any kind of formal uh, restrictions on age. So this idea that the, somehow the, uh, the naming of the presidents are taking that away is going to be a, a, a really huge issue is, I, I think, a little bit overblown. I think people look too much at uh, this as a game of musical chairs, and, and they forget the fact that this is, the Chinese uh, government works mostly on planning. It's very, very long-term. They spend millions of hours putting together their, their um, uh, plans and uh, economic policies. So it's not something where uh, one person has as much sway as people think. I think there's a feeling that she has been very efficient in taking care of the corruption issue and rebuilding the party and that this will take more time than uh, than another five years all right can I, ask this, you though, can I ask you though um, his his uh, term lasts till 2023 uh, why now why choose to do away with this limit as early as 2018 uh, is does this sort of uh, coincide with what you're calling as uh, china's long-term planning well, I, I think so. I mean, on a very practical basis. I mean, you, you, you know, in the United States, as soon as you're in halfway through your second term, you face this kind of lame duck period when people start to look at who's going to be coming in after you. I think she and the party wanted to uh, definitely signal that, you know, the work that's being done is going to continue and that there's not they should not be looking at this as any kind of lame duck term in any sense of the word that he will stay and the policies will stay until the party is rebuilt and the corruption issues are redone. You have to remember from China's perspective, they're at a very sensitive time. They're trying to uh, climb into the uh, top echelon of economic uh, competitors. Um, they want to uh, get beyond the middle income trap and they see, to a certain extent, uh, a lot of uh, powers opposed to them, especially the U.S. I mean, we've seen the, the trade uh, and um, tariffs that have been imposed and, and the rhetoric that is constantly on display by uh, Donald Trump and many of his um, uh, senior advisors. Right. So they feel that they have to move forward very uh, carefully and they have to move forward with certainty.
Okay, can I ask you um, if it is as innocuous this, this change or, or amendment to the constitution, if it's as innocuous as you're making it out to be, why has there been such a crackdown on anyone raising questions about it? I mean, uh, there's been a crackdown on social media posts, on search terms themselves, asking questions about whether this is the right thing for China. Well, I, I mean, the Chinese system is is pretty simple. Uh, once there's a lot of debate behind the curtain, but once a decision is made, uh, everybody is supposed to step in line. This but is this, kind of like a parliamentary. But this, uh, I, I apologize for interrupting, but these crackdowns started uh, even before the decision was made. I mean, the, the decision was made right now, a few hours, a couple of. Uh, uh, minutes before we've started talking, but the crackdown has been in place over the past week ever since the suggestion came up. Well, I, I think it's actually there has been a lot of attention paid to media even before that. This is not a, a new phenomenon. During this last week, there was, a, I think, a real effort to make sure that people were working uh, in lockstep. I mean, people were getting calls saying that, you know, this is a, a matter of party discipline. Uh, we expect you to follow the party line. I mean, when you join the party and the government, this is part of your responsibility. It's, it's a very different from our expectations of a democracy. This is their particular system. It seems to be working for them. Uh, and it's uh, mostly an internal matter. I, I, I just think that sometimes we equate our systems you know if you had the president and no term limits but the president's in, in uh, the united states for instance carries a tr tremendous amount of power that is the seat of power whereas in china uh, it's a title it's a figurehead but as i said before the main power rests in the military commission and the chairmanship of the party all right, stay with me. Jayadev Ranade, President, uh, Center for China Analysis and Studies, joining us as well. Mr. Ranade, good afternoon. Thank you for speaking with us. Um, Aina Tange and my other guest uh, said it would be, uh, a, you know, perhaps jumping the gun if we are to assume that uh, doing away with uh, this presidential term limit is going to equal, uh, you know, lifetime rule for Xi Jinping. Would you agree? Well, uh, actually, uh they are right in the sense that merely removing the term limit from the post of president uh, doesn't guarantee a life tenure. That depends on Xi Jinping, how long he wants to continue. There are no limits on the post of uh, party general secretary, which is the most important, and the second one of chairman of the military commission. So uh, he already has uh, very strong positions uh, without a term limit. This was the only one with a term limit. But I think more important is that in this process and at the 19th Party Congress and now at the NPC, what uh, has uh, Xi Jinping has done is he's removed the difference between the party and the state and uh, therefore made, it, uh, made his position, uh, which has all three posts of Party General Secretary, Chairman of the Military Commission and President of China, the most uh, powerful position in China. Do you think this is going to have an impact uh, on ties between China and India? Or I, let me be more specific, does India need to be even more wary of China given what's happened today? Let me, uh, if I may, uh, answer your question in a different way. Please that do. with uh, Xi Jinping having now assumed all these powers, and I'm not talking about, uh, you know, the suggestion by one of the provincial party secretaries that he's a living Buddha, but... If we accept that he has uh, got all this, then uh, what we would be seeing is the key flagship projects that Xi Jinping is pushing, namely the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, will be followed with even greater vigor. And that will put countries in China's neighborhood under pressure. Second, the ambitions that Xi Jinping has outlined for China, benchmark in 2021 23 2030 and 2050 will also be pushed with greater vigor and these three together um, are designed to push China up to the rank of the top power in the world. So obviously there will be a lot of pressure and I think as far as India is concerned with our direct, uh, it will have direct implications for us because of our outstanding border issues.
Right. Sir, can I also ask you uh, very quickly one last question? Um, you know, uh, we've been uh, building up to this uh, for a while now. Uh, this, uh, you know, him choosing not to even name a successor. There were rumors already doing the rounds about whether he is considering uh, being a president for life. Um, but if we are to look at this from uh, the perspective of uh, China's growing aggression in the Indian Ocean region, uh, South China Sea, are we looking at, uh, you know, a tonic shift in global policy as well towards uh, China, something that we saw happen with President Trump takeover last year. Do you think this is going to cause uh, similar, let's say, uh, repercussions in uh, at least in the in the cup, next couple of years to come? Well, I would uh, say that uh, the assertiveness that China has shown, which I would say Xi Jinping blended with a dose of aggressiveness, is going to become even more forceful. So in the Indian Ocean, certainly we will see greater Chinese presence and activities. I already see that the pace of development and construction of warships and aircraft has increased. The number of, uh, you know, the kind of training that they are imparting has gone up. And these are all indicative that Xi Jinping is fully determined on ensuring that he has an armed force at his beck and command that will uh, not only safeguard Chinese interests, but also advance them. So I think... Uh, we are going to see possibly not a tectonic shift in the sense of something happening suddenly, but a greater push now for something that has been in process for, a, for some time. All right. Jayadev Ranade, thank you very much, sir, for speaking with us and sharing your perspective with us. Aina Tangen continues to be with us on the broadcast. Uh, let me take one uh, last question across to you, Aina, before we let you go. Um, obviously, a lot of commentary has already been generated online on uh, this change. But overall, in your perspective, do you think this is a good thing for China? Well, at, at this juncture it is, but I, I think over the long term, a lot will depend on what Xi Jinping does in the future. And by that, I mean... Under Deng, you saw the so same consolidation of power because he was trying to push China in what he thought was a needed direction. Uh, he then, uh, when he uh, stepped down or partially stepped down, made sure that it became a very, very different process, that no one inherited the kind of uh, absolute powers that he had. And I would expect that she will do the exact same thing as soon as he's uh, comfortable and the party is comfortable with the, the direction having been, been set, I think you'll see a, a backtracking down and, and perhaps changes the Constitution once again to make it a much more inclusive and deliberative pr uh, process and a little less centered on one person. Right. Uh, I apologize. I said last question last time around, but one more comes to mind right now. Um, a lot's been talked about his, uh, you know, role as somebody uh, or reputation as someone who is tough on corruption. Uh, there's been a purge as far as, uh, you know, corrupt officials go as well. But has he made a number of enemies in the process as well? And does that also have to be considered when we're looking at this huge change that's taken place today? Well, obviously, there are people who are very unhappy with the direction he's taken, especially as anti-corruption. I mean, people um, might say he's corrupt, but they'll say, oh, many people are corrupt. Why did they pick on this person or that person? They all have families. They all have friends. And, and this is part of what I was talking about earlier. If, if you're trying to urge your followers to follow through on this anti-corruption uh, things and rebuilding a the party, they have to be assured that they're not going to be that subjects of revenge by these people who are kind of waiting in the weeds for them. So it's very important that he sends out a very clear signal that this is not going to be temporary, that this is something that's going to be followed through to the end. Very important to the party as a whole. So timing wise, I think it's good. Now, uh, I don't know that you want to have this kind of concentration of power being passed on from generation to generation, though. All right, we leave it at that. Aina, thanks very much for joining us uh, and sharing your perspective with us. We'll stick with the story, though, a while longer for our viewers who are just joining in. This is the big news coming out of not just China, but uh, Asia, really speaking. The National People's Congress has decided to abolish the presidential term limit. China has approved the removal of term limits for its leaders in a move that effectively could allow Xi Jinping to remain president for life. The constitutional changes were passed by China's annual sitting of the National People's Congress. The vote was uh, widely regarded as a rubber stamping exercise. Now, two delegates voted against the change and three abstained out of a total 2,964 votes that were cast. 
China has imposed a two-term limit on its president since the 1990s. The Chinese president, Xi Jinping, however, defied tradition of uh, presenting a potential successor during October's Communist Party Congress. In late February, the party proposed removing term limits from China's constitution. She was due to step down in 2023. With me on the broadcast is Andrew K.P. Leung, an international and independent strategist. He's joining us on the broadcast as well. Good afternoon, uh, Andrew. Thank you for speaking with us. We were yeah, speculating yeah. about this just uh, yesterday, and now it is uh, out in the open. How do you view this development in China? Well, this is a game changer because it, it, it is uh, in, uh, constitutionalizing, you know, by constitution constitutionalizing the one-party rule uh, because previously under the uh, constitution um, the party and the state are supposed to be relatively separate but now it's the party and the state are kind of fused together uh, under the one-party system and and past experience um, suggests that this model has served China well um, and of course um, it is the uh, leadership by the most able I think that there is a broad uh, consensus in spite of some dissenting voices. So that's what's happening. Okay, so two votes against, three abstaining. Uh, but a, a concentration of power such as this, the doing away of the difference between party and state, does it raise concerns uh, about you know the possibility of uh, this a, a dictatorial style of governance coming into play? Uh, well, the uh, one-party state has always been... Um, somewhat dictatorial, um, but, in, in, uh, but it doesn't mean that the decisions are made arbitrarily because the, uh, the um, uh, decisions are usually, um, it's a, it's a lot of feed uh, from expert uh, voices, expert groups, uh, including international advisors. So you can see that there are some, uh, all sorts of internal debate about certain ideas and policies. And also there has been a great deal of uh, public hearing even. I mean, you can look at the major legislation in the past uh, five or, or ten years. So it's not, um, um, on the one hand, there is a cramp down on dissent, when dissent is seen to be threatening stability. But on the other hand, uh, there is still um, a, a great deal of, of space uh, for um, public to express, express their views on certain legislation uh, about the satisfaction with corruption. Um, and in fact, the public um, media is, is um, it's, uh, it's used to um, monitor um, um, uh, corruption as well. All right. Uh, we leave it at that. Andrew K.P. Leung, thanks very much for joining us and sharing your perspective with us uh, on this all-important story, one that, of course, we are going to keep a keen eye on through the day. It's going to have uh, major ramifications, not just in China, but uh, in terms of Asia and, of course, uh, global politics as well. For now, though, let's uh, turn our attention to another uh, piece of news from China. A senior Islamic official there has warned against Islamization in the country. The official has warned Chinese Muslims of uh, mosques that copy foreign styles and strive to practice their faith in a more Chinese way. Yang Faming, head of the government-linked China Islamic Association, said that Islam had a long and glorious history in China. However, he warned of problems that are becoming apparent in recent years. China is home to roughly 20 million Muslims, many living in the western part of the country. While China officially guarantees freedom of religion, it has in recent years tightened control in heavily Muslim areas.